All right, everybody. So we just finished talking about enzymes and how they help lower the amount of energy that's needed to get a reaction started. And we've and throughout this whole biochemistry unit, we're going to be we've been talking about energy a lot. But what is the form of energy that your body actually uses and manipulates? Well, it is ATP. So we're going to spend a little bit of time right now talking about what ATP is and how it works. All right, remember that you are an endergonic system. You need an energy input. You, mu you do not survive without constant energy coming into your system. And why do you need energy? Well, to build biomolecules. You can build up muscles and bones and ce cells and everything else. You need it for reproduction, for movement, for active transport, and to regulate your temperature. Just to name a few things that you need energy for. All right, so remember we just talked about this when we talked about enzymes, that the work of life is done by coupling reactions. A reaction that releases energy is put together with a reaction that needs energy. Okay, so this top reaction releases energy, and then the energy from that goes into the bottom reaction and makes the bottom one happen. Well, how is it that we shuffle this energy around? Um, you get energy by eating your organic molecules. You get energy from carbohydrates, proteins, um, lipids, okay? You break them down and um, energy is released out of those molecules as you digest them and break the bonds. Well, we need to then capture that energy in a form that can actually be used by a cell. So the energy currency that we use in our cells is actually called ATP. So what is ATP? It's um, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. So tri means three. One, two, three phosphate groups, okay? It's an adenine, a sugar, and three phosphates, okay? So it's a modified nucleotide. Um, this adenine, sugar, and one phosphate is the A that goes into DNA with then, um, so we also call that sometimes AMP, the M standing for monophosphate. Okay. Then if you add a phosphate on there and end up with two phosphates, we call it ADP or adenosine diphosphate, di for two. Okay. And then you add the third one on and you get ATP for triphosphate. Okay. Adding each phosphate on is endergonic. It requires energy to put each on. So then releasing each is then therefore going to be exergonic. You get some energy out each time you release one. So how is it that ATP stores energy? Well, it stores it in the bonds holding the phosphate groups on. Okay? If you notice, the phosphates are really negative molecules. They have these ne all these negative oxygens on them. Okay? So putting negative and negative and making them stick together, that takes a lot of energy because negatives and negatives want to repel each other. So each one is harder to put on. That means that those bonds are not very stable, which means they have a lot of energy in them. Okay, the third one is the hardest one to get on, so that's the one that has the most energy that it can release. Okay, and those bonds, it's, like I said, they're unstable. It's like they're spring-loaded. That phosphates are just ready to pop off and release energy when they pop off. Okay. All right, so how does ATP transfer energy? When ATP goes to ADP, goes from three phosphates to two, there's now this lone phosphate group just hanging out. Okay. And when that phosphate comes off, the molecule actually releases 7.3 kcals of energy. Okay? That 7.3 kcals can be used then to fuel other reactions. And that happens by taking this phosphate and shoving it onto another molecule. We call that phosphorylation. Putting the phosphate onto another molecule is going to make that new molecule really unstable and give it energy. Right. The enzymes that phosphorylate that take these phosphate groups, oops. Sorry. The enzymes that take these phosphate groups and stick them onto molecules, we call them kinases. So if you ever hear about a kinase, kinase enzyme, you'll know that it's talking about an enzyme that puts phosphate groups onto molecules from ATP. All right, so we, we want to build this polymer from these two monomers, okay? So remember, this is going to be a dehydration synthesis because the OH is going to come off of one, the H comes off of the other, the two pieces are going to go together and water is going to come out. Well, this specific reaction here is going to require an input of 4.2 kcals of energy. Okay? So in order to make that happen, we're going to use phosphorylation to destabilize one of these molecules and give it enough energy that this can happen. All right, so watch this. You take the first little sugar, 
you mix it with ATP, and you take the phosphate off, one phosphate off of ATP, and put it onto the sugar. So now you've got a phosphorylated sugar and ADP. This phosphorylated sugar has now been given 7.3 kcals of energy, okay? And a kinase enzyme is what made that happen. Okay, so now you take your phosphorylated sugar and mix it with your other sugar. They bond together and the phosphate comes off. Remember, you needed an input of 4.2. You now have an output of 7.3 from the ATP. So you're actually left over with 3.1 kcals that didn't, weren't even needed. That's one of the reasons that you get hot as you build, as you work, as you do things, is because your body is always releasing more of the energy. Every time ATP is used, it's very rare that you're gonna use up all of the energy from it. So you're gonna have an excess of energy that comes out of your body as heat. Okay, so this 3.1 here would be released as heat in this reaction. All right, so let's use another example of this. Um, in the beginning of cellular respiration, um, remember, just hopefully briefly from intro bio, that cellular respiration is the process of getting energy out of our food, and it usually starts with glucose. And we break down glucose, and we use the energy from glucose to make ATP. But glucose itself is a really, really stable molecule. It's this covalent, um, covalently bonded molecule with these really nice, happy bonds. So getting it to start breaking down requires an input of energy requires some activation to happen. And the way that that happens is that glucose becomes phosphorylated. Two ATPs go in, and each um, one is gonna use a different kinase enzyme to phosphorylate glucose. So you go from glucose to this molecule, whose name you don't need to remember, um, and it's got two phosphate groups added onto it. Now you've just put two times 7.3, so that's 14.6 kcals of energy into this glucose. That's a lot of energy to put in. You've really destabilized this molecule, and now it's much easier for it to break in half. And as soon as you start breaking it in half, you can start getting into the bonds, start breaking those bond, the rest of the bonds, releasing the energy that's in them, and using that energy to make more ATP. So yeah, we invested two ATP to start the reaction, but we're gonna get out a ton at the end. And it's through this phosphorylation that we get everything rolling. This is the activation that had to happen. Okay, could have lit it on fire, but that would make you really uncomfortable. So instead, we use ATP, yay ATP. Okay, now um, the ATP ADP cycle. This is something we're going to talk about, and it's in your um, your study guide. And for whatever reason, it's a question that kids almost always get wrong on the study guide. They're like the ATP cycle. I don't get it. This right here, my dears, is the ATP cycle. It's much easier than you may have been trying to make it out to be. ATP releases energy and breaks down to ADP plus P. Okay, every time you need energy, you take an ATP, you break it down, you release some energy, 7.3 kcal specifically, and you get ADP and P. Then when you've got extra energy in your body, you're gonna put it in and take the ADP and the P and put them back together to make ATP, and that's your cycle going from ATP to ADP. Why do you have to keep doing the cycle back and forth and back and forth? It's because you can't store ATP. ATP is an extremely unstable molecule. It's a really good energy donor, okay? Those phosphates are way too easily transferred from one molecule to another, popped off, pop off this one, pop back onto that one, happens way too fast. You cannot have liquid ATP in a bottle. I actually, a kid told me one time that they saw on eBay that you could buy a bottle of ATP. Scam, can't happen. ATP is not stable enough to exist in liquid state. It only exists for a couple seconds here or there at most. So we can only use it for short-term storage. For longer-term storage, you've got carbohydrates and fats. Okay, so you go from ATP down to ADP and back. Back and forth, back and forth, and this happens close to 10 million times per second in one working muscle. So you need a ton of ATP at every moment of your entire life, okay? So you gotta make sure you got enough glucose and enough oxygen that you can get to that ATP. All right, so cells spend a lot of their time making ATP, and we use it for everything else. How they do that, we're gonna talk about in several more units, but I want you to know what ATP is and how it works. 
All right, guys, so we want to spend a minute talking about the structure of DNA. Why is it that the two strands of DNA have to run anti-parallel to each other? And why is it that DNA can only be replicated in the five prime to three prime direction? Well, it's all about energy. Remember, where does the energy for a bond usually come from? Well, it comes from ATP. Look, here's our ATP right here. The adenine, the sugar, and the three phosphates. Okay. There's ADP, and remember, when a phosphate comes off of ATP and forms ADP, energy is released, okay? And then, if you take off two phosphates, you get AMP. Well, this AMP right here is what's gonna be used to help build DNA. This is a nucleotide right there, okay? All right, so nucleotides come with their own energy already attached to them, okay? Um, is ATP the only high energy nucleotide? Nope, there's also GTP, which can be converted to GMP. And then there's TTP, which can be converted to TMP. And then there's CTP, that can be converted to CMP. All right, each of these, as you take off the two phosphates, you're gonna get a release of energy. All right, so when nucleotides come over to DNA to help with DNA replication or the building of a DNA molecule, they're gonna come over as nucleosides, not nucleotides. And when they're nucleosides, they're in that TP state. They've got the three phosphates with them. So they come over with those three phosphates with that energy that's gonna then be used to make the bonds between the nucleotides. Okay, so there's your ATP, your GTP, your TTP, and your CTP. Okay, they arrive with their own energy source. And then the enzyme DNA polymerase, polymerize means to build, make a polymer. ACE enzyme, the enzyme that makes a DNA polymer. Like how those names work, okay? All right, so when we add bases, they're added onto the three prime end, okay? And um, you always need a starter nucleotide. We'll talk about that later when we get into more DNA, but I want you to understand the energy aspect of this right now. Okay, so the strand can only grow five prime to three prime because that's the only way that the energy works. So watch this. When it comes in, it comes in when it's with its three phosphates. DNA polymerase comes on. It's gonna break off those extra two phosphates and form the bond between the three prime carbon and the phosphate and release some energy. Okay, and then we do it again and again and again. Okay, five prime to three prime direction. And notice how the two sides, this side, if you're looking at it, appears to be upside down, and this side appears to be right side up. They run in opposite directions of each other because that way there's the energy there to make these bonds, okay? What, and so then when we're replicating DNA, we split the DNA molecule in half, and each side can now be used as a template to build a new strand, okay? So here we go, we build, there's five prime, there's three prime, five prime, three prime. So we build on this side from five prime to three prime. We'll talk about the primers later, so don't worry about those yet. You bring in your nucleus side, you see that the phosphates are all right there, ready to bind up. Provide the energy to make that bond, provide the energy to make the bond, provide it to make the bond, and provide it to make the bond. Woohoo! we made another strand, life is good. Now, what about this molecule over here? What if we try to build it in the wrong direction, okay? Three prime to five prime. What if we try to go from the three prime end to the five prime end? Okay, so there's your primer. Now we put this on. Uh-oh, where's the energy to form this bond here before between this three prime carbon and that phosphate? The energy's in the wrong spot. Can't form the bond, okay? If there's no energy, the bond's not gonna form. So instead of building three prime to five prime, the cell builds five prime to three prime. And then you've got the energy to do what you need to do, okay? So again, DNA replication and all the parts of it, we're gonna look at it again later. But I know that you did the, the paper modeling of DNA and it may have been confusing to you why you had to build in the direction you did. Well, it's all about energy, okay? When the nucleotides come over, they come over with three phosphates and then they line up in such a way that when the two phosphates are removed, there's energy there to build that bond right there. Okay, hope that makes sense. See you guys next time.